Good afternoon. We'd like to ask everyone to please take their seat so we can start on time. Take a break. I'll shoot a note over to Teresa to email it to you. Doesn't have to. I won't remember. Well, I will, but it'll be like you know, it's three o'clock in the morning next Tuesday. I don't have to have it. Can you tell me the next Tuesday? Yeah. Leslie, it's right here. Okay, bang the gavel. Good afternoon. We're ready to begin, everyone. Please take your seats. Leslie. Right here, Leslie. Okay, they're quiet. They're quieting down, Tom. So now's your chance. Am I starting? Yeah, I think you should start. This is your place. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ted Cook. I'm the general manager of the Central Arizona Project. I'd like to welcome everyone here to CAP headquarters for the first meeting of the Arizona Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan, or LBDCP, steering committee meeting, number one. And uh, my co-chair, uh, Tom Bashatsky, director of ADWR, and I would like to Welcome all the delegates, alternates that are in the audience. Everyone, thank you so much for coming here. We have believe we've built a lot of momentum so far in the meetings that we've had starting last month, and, and uh, today will be no exception, I don't think. Um, I would like to provide some logistical information first. This microphone system, of course, it's a new microphone system that we never tried out before in a meeting like this. Only three microphones can be... Um, on at one time. And so that doesn't prevent people from pushing the little face with the noise coming out of it on the, the control panel, but that will shut someone else off. So, uh, and that is likely to be... <laughs> that, that, is, that is likely to be uh, uh, me or Tom, so please don't do that. Um, and we'll, we'll, try, we'll try and be as informal as possible to acknowledge folks to... Uh, turn on their microphone. And Kathy, you have your microphone on right now, I see. Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, so after, after you're acknowledged, everyone, please get in the practice of turn on your mic, say what you have to say, and when you're done, turn it off, and that will prevent any kind of unexpected technological glitches. Um, the, uh, the restrooms, for people who are wondering, are right over here. So you go out any of the doors along that side wall and walk that way, and those are the restrooms. There are drinking fountains and things like that. There's a soda machine down there and, and other things uh, uh, for that. If there are people who are standing in the back, we had reserved the first couple of rows for staff to the delegates. Um, but I think it's probably safe enough now that we've got, it looks like about 10 or 12 chairs that people can move up. You don't need to stand. We also have overflow, I believe, across the hall in the back here um, that if you can't fit in this room, this proceedings is being piped into there and you can watch from the other room uh, rather than stand in the back. I think that was all that we had to cover with respect to logistics. So I want to reiterate my thanks to everyone for attending and for 
being willing to participate in this process. Um, we have a very uh, aggressive schedule over the next few months, a lot of work to do to try to achieve the ultimate outcome of the steering committee. Briefly, I'll go over the agenda. You can see it up on the screens, and I think we've made packets available to folks around the table at least. So we, we're in the middle of welcoming introductions. We'll talk a little bit about the process. We have a break in here early on. We probably will not take it where it is in the agenda. And we'll, Ted and I will play it by ear a little bit to have the break at the appropriate time. We'll talk about the framework for implementing the, the DCP in Arizona, an overview of the four key elements, uh, some next steps, and an opportunity for the, a call to the public. So with that, I will now ask the delegates around the table to introduce themselves and their alternates who they've assigned, uh, who they represent, and also the sector that they are representing. So I will start to my right. David Godleski, Southern Arizona Home Builders Association, uh, representing uh, the development sector. Dennis Rule is uh, our alternate. John Kameek, Town of Marana Water Department. I'm representing Pima County Ag and the Southern Arizona Water Users Association. I am the alternate for Brian Wong of BKW Farms representing the ag sector. Stephanie Smallhouse, President of Arizona Farm Bureau, here representing the agriculture industry, and our alternate is Chelsea McGuire. Virginia O'Connell, uh, Arizona Water Banking Authority, and my alternate is Terry Subrasi. Wade Noble, Yuma County Agriculture Water Coalition. The alternate is Megan Scott. Paul Norm, I serve as general. The other one. Paul. <laughs> Paul Orm, uh, I'm general counsel to uh, four Pinell County uh, irrigation districts. I'm representing Pinell County Agriculture, and my alternate is Dan Jones. Lois Lakimoto, uh, chair for Mojave County Water Authority, Mojave County supervisor, and I'm representing Mojave County, and my alternate is Jamie Kelly. Joe Olson, general manager of Metro Water District. Under the municipal sector, my alternate is Wally Wilson. Bill Garfield, I'm president of Arizona Water Company, uh, representing the municipal provider sector. Uh, my alternate is Fred Schneider, vice president of engineering for Arizona Water Company. Uh, despite what the sign says, I am Troy Day, uh, EPCOR Water. I am the alternate. Joe Geisel, uh, president of EPCOR Water, is, is the primary. Um, Javier Sedovich, City of Goodyear. Our, our alternate is Dan Cotterman, and I represent the municipal sector. I am not Brian Beesmeyer. I'm Kathy Rawl from the City of Scottsdale. I'm the alternate. Brian Beesmeyer, Beyer, excuse me, Brian Beesmeyer is the delegate. We are representing the municipal sector. I'm Tim Tom, your director of Tucson Water, representing the municipal sector. And my alternate is Andrew Greenhill of the City of Tucson. Good afternoon. My name is Laura Grignano. I'm the manager of the Central Arizona Groundwater Replenishment District. My alternate is Perry Benamellis, manager of the CAGRD Water Supply Program. And we are representing the CAGRD. Uh, Shane Leonard, General Manager, Roosevelt Water Conservation District, representing Ag, and my alternate is Brad Streeter. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Rowe Lewis. I know we have agricultural, municipal, and tribal interests here, um, and I'm here specifically representing tribal interests, and I am the governor of the Gila River Indian Community, and my alternate is Councilman Marlon Dixon, who is here in the audience. Thank you. Um, Cheryl Lombard, uh, President of Valley Partnership. My alternate is John Graham of Sunbelt Holdings. We're representing the development industry. 
Good afternoon. I'm uh, Ted Maxwell, the president of Southern Arizona Leadership Council. We're uh, representing the economic development sector. Uh, my alternate is Kip Volpe with the Estes Corporation, and we both are members of the Tucson Regional Water Coalition as well. Uh, my name is Dennis Patch. I'm chairman of the Colorado River Indian Tribes, representing the Colorado River Indian Tribes. My alternate is Keith Moses, vice chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthony Francisco, sitting in for Chairman Edward Manuel. Um, I'm on the Legislative Council representative, sitting uh, as a vice chairman of our Water Resource Committee. Good afternoon. I'm Sandy Favorites from Freeport McMoran, uh, representing in industry, and my alternate is Richard Bark. Good afternoon. My name is Ted Kowalski, and I represent the Walton Family Foundation. Uh, and I lead their Colorado River Initiative. Thank you for including us. I represent the NGO community, and my alternate is Kevin Moran of Environmental Defense Fund. Good. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dave Roberts, and I represent Salt River Project, and we're here on behalf of SRP, and my alternate is Chuck Potolak. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'm Rosanna Gavaldon, Arizona State Representative for Legislative District 2. And my, um, so that's part of Southern Arizona. Uh, and my alternate is State Representative Kirsten Engel. Thank you. I apologize for walking in late. I was over at ADWR, so my apologies. My name is Senator Lisa Otondo and I represent Legislative District 4. My alternate is Senator Andrea D'Alessandro. I'm Senator Gail Griffin. I represent District 14, and I'm the chairman of the Senate Natural Resource Energy and Water Committee, and my alternate is Jeff Cross. I'm Representative Rusty Bowers. I represent District 25. Um, in the Arizona legislature, and my alternate on this in this endeavor is Mr. David Cook, Representative Cook, who's with us today. Good afternoon, Glenn Hammer, Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Good afternoon, I'm Lisa Atkins, President of the Central Arizona Project Board, and my alternate is Karen Caesar, who's also a board member. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Karen, sorry. Uh, my alternate is yeah. Uh, my alternate is Jim Hallway, who's the vice president of the CAP board. Karen, your turn. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, but yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Karen Caesar, um, a CAP board member uh, representing Pima County, and my alternate is Mark Taylor. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hunter Moore. I work for Governor Ducey. I'm representing the office of the governor. Good afternoon. My name is Leslie Myers. I'm here representing the United States Bureau of Reclamation, and my alternate is Lisa Lance with the uh, Department of Interior Solicitor's Office. I would also like to um, announce it's not on the sheet that's in the packet, but uh, uh, Chairman, uh, Co Chair, uh, Director Bushtotsky and I do have alternates, even though we are co-chairs, and if one of us is not available, that's what the other one is here for, and we will alternate uh, chairman duties. But we also have alternates, uh, so that if one of us is absent, we will have somebody else filling in for us. And my alternate is Suzanne Tickner, Director of Water Policy for CAP. And my alternate is Clint Chandler, Assistant Director for DWR. We would also like to recognize, in addition to the elected officials that we have around the table, uh, other elected officials that we're aware of, who are, this is always a dangerous thing to do because we, we hope not to leave anyone out. Other elected officials that have joined us today, we really appreciate um, them all being here. Uh, it includes Senator Sina Kerr, um, Representative David Cook, who was uh, um, uh, pointed out before, uh, we also have some uh, tribal elective representative here, um, council member from the Colorado River Indian Tribe, uh, Bobby Page is here, 
Uh, we also I need to switch some papers. We also have uh, Adam Andrews from the Tonawatham Santa Vera district is here. He's a vice chairman of the Alati Association. Uh, and uh, Marlon Dixon, who is on the Gila River Indian Community Council. Um, and also uh, our, um, a couple more of our uh, uh, CAWCD board members are here, Mr. Pat Jacobs from Pima County, and also Alexander Arbolita from Maricopa County. Hope I didn't forget anyone else. We also like to welcome Jack Jackson from Congressman O'Halloran's office is with us today. Thanks everyone for your interest and for coming. Ready to switch. So we'd like to start with a few words um, to reiterate what we have communicated in the last two meetings that we had in, in June and earlier this month. Why LBDCP is important to Arizona. Uh, and these points were, were made primarily in the, in the first meeting at the end of July. There is an increased risk of Lake Mead reaching critically low elevations without additional action. That the, the uh, actions that were prescribed in the 2007 guidelines are not going to be sufficient. The risk due to continued drought in the upper basin um, primarily has uh, increased significantly since the guidelines were put in place and the LBDCP is designed to reduce that risk back down to a more acceptable uh, level. Um, collective action is needed and the DCP is one way to get collective action among all of the basin states. So we refer to the LBDCP, the lower basin DCP. There is an upper basin DCP as well. So all seven basin states are engaged in this effort. The United States, the Republic of Mexico under minute 323, uh, if, this, if, if we get this work done, we'll activate additional cuts in Mexico as well and reduce the risk for everyone. And then lastly, um, uh, the risk uh, for shortage is, uh, is, is sooner uh, and sooner as early as, as 2020. I'd like to refer to you for a moment to the graphs that the Bureau of Reclamation showed at our June meeting. This is elevation 1020 in Lake Mead when the lake is roughly 22% full. The graph on the left represents um, the, the historical full hydrology from, uh, from the beginning of the last century until now and shows that the gray on the bottom there, again, just to remind everybody, shows what the, what the measured modeled risk was at the time the guidelines were put into place. The green line shows that it has increased significantly and that with DCP, that risk is reduced by about two-thirds, much closer to where it was anticipated to be when the guidelines were done. On the right is a more conservative hydrology. We call it the stress test hydrology and um, that uh, we are using um, uh, for, for uh, the modeling now in addition to the full hydrology and shows that the um, risk of shortage by 2026 when the guidelines end it approaches 50%, but implementing the DCP will reduce that by about three quarters. So now we'll turn to you know, discussion of the mission of the steering committee, and that is to discuss and recommend how to adopt and implement the Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan in a way that is acceptable to Arizona water users. I think you already know that DWR and CAP have established a steering committee to achieve that mission, and that uh, CAWCD and DWR are working as the co-chairs we really talked about this mission already at both our June 28th and July 10th meetings uh, and described it then as to discuss and recommend how to adopt and implement the Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan in a way that is acceptable to Arizona water users. So again, referring back to the previous slide that Ted just went through, under the stress test hydrology, there is almost a one in two chance of Lake Mead uh, falling below elevation 1020 before 2026 20, without the drought contingency plan. And the lower basin drought contingency plan significantly re reduces the risk of Lake Mead falling below 1020. We do have a limited uh, window of time before the 2019 Arizona legislative session 
to take the steps necessary to adopt and implement the Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan. So again, we have a lot of work and a short time to get there. So the steering committee objectives. We are seeking broad commitment and support for the implementation of the Drought Contingency Plan in Arizona. We want to recommend appropriate and sustainable processes and tools to achieve the implementation of a lower basin development drought contingency plan in Arizona. And again, to obtain the approval by the Arizona legislature of a joint resolution authorizing the director of DWR to agree to the drought contingency plan. So again, I think most folks are familiar with those objectives from our past discussions as well. So we wanted to talk about some proposed sideboards. Hopefully these sideboards will make this process as efficient as possible and help us all have some robust discussions as we work through a lot of very difficult issues. So first, we want to focus on the adoption and implementation of the Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan in Arizona. We want to avoid bringing in topics that are not relevant to or essential for the developing and implementation plan for the Lower Basin Development, for the, sorry, the Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan in Arizona. We understand there are a lot of tangents to the issues, but we don't have the time to go off into issues that are not related to the Drought Contingency Plan. We want to operate within and respect existing legal authorities, uh, contracts, and priorities. This means working within existing authorities, contracts, and priorities, not replacing those with some other new rules. New agreements may be developed that are consistent with existing authorities, contracts, priorities, and that are mutually acceptable to impacted parties. Third, we want to seek solutions that acknowledge that the impacts of a reduced supply differ among water users. This process is designed to partially mitigate the incremental impacts of the drought contingency plan on Arizona water users. Notwithstanding the benefits of the drought contingency plan due to reductions in risks to some Arizona water users, nobody should seek to improve the position therein without the drought contingency plan through this process. We ask people to please respect the steering committee process and each other. The delegates should not undermine the integrity of the process by disrespecting other delegates or denigrating the work of the steering committee or the work we are doing, especially outside the room or with the media. Debates and disagreements we ask should be handled respectfully at the steering committee meetings. And while CAP and DWR are jointly leading the process, the input ideas, questions, and dialogue from the delegates and public is vital to, and welcome. We ask the public to participate with questions and comments regarding the agenda items and delegate discussion during the public comment period. DWR and CAP will lead the discussions at each meeting and will answer questions, provide technical information, and highlight unresolved issues for the benefit of the committee. Please be sure to share your thoughts with us. It is important that DWR and CAP and other members of the committee to know where you stand in order for this process to be successful. And our last sideboard, we need to come to an agreement of appropriate documentation of the proceedings, and this is somewhat of an action item for us today. So we'll note that at the first meeting, we are recording these proceedings and intend to post the recording. Going forward, we want to hear your views among the committee about continuing down that path on recording uh, these meetings and posting them, or if you think there's some other alternative that would still uh, work for all of us to be able to memorialize what we're talking about and for the public to follow what is going on. So are folks comfortable in the committee with having these proceedings recorded and posting them on DWR and CAWCD's website after the fact, and I'm seeing virtually all heads shaking yes. So for the record, I think we have good support and agreement that that will help move this process forward 
So we will continue that process in, in our next meetings of recording and posting. Director, will that include posting the handouts as well? Yes, and actually the handouts that we have today that we're showing on the screen were posted, I believe, by both organizations at 1230 uh, this morning so that folks could have a chance to see them as they walked in. We had put the specific uh, site on that first slide as folks walked in. So if you wanted to use your computers and call them up, that would be available to everybody. And we'll continue that practice of posting them a little bit before the meetings begin. So we'll move back now to Ted. We'd like to spend a little I'd like to spend a little time on the role of the delegates. I think we, we've heard some um, this morning uh, from the delegates themselves about the sectors that, that they are representing in addition to their own organization. But uh, 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 Tom and I would, would just like to expand a little bit on, on what our expectations are and make sure that we're all on the, on the same page. And if you have any ideas about should we be doing this or should we be doing that, let's get that straightened out here too. Um, as I just alluded to, we, we ha, uh, would ask the delegates to do a broader job than just represent their own agency, but to be a resource for the people in their sector and even outside their sector um, to, to exchange information from what goes on here and collect feedback from the folks that, that are in your sector and in the community so that can be part of this conversation right here. Um, again, reaching out to the members of your constituency to make sure they're aware of what is going on here. We're doing the best we can to publicize uh, the, the, the time and location of these meetings. We'll get to that in, more in a minute um, and to stay and keep those people well informed um, and bring back input from your constituency to the steering committee for consideration during its deliberations. We see that we've got a full house again today like the other two meetings. There's lots of engaged, enthusiastic, smart, talented people and we'd love to have a bigger table than we already have and include everyone directly in the conversation, but it's just impossible to do. And we've received a lot of queries from folks about, is there more room on the steering committee? Can we add a, this person or that person? And sadly, we have to tell those people, no, we're, the, the committee is as big as it can get. But those people have a role to play too. Please engage with your delegates and, and be the other half of this equation that we're, that we're describing here. Uh, so that we can be as effective as possible. Some of that has already begun. I know, for instance, that the Bureau of Reclamation has already started a tribal stakeholder process of, for broader tribal representation. That type of thing has already happened. We've already received correspondence that has included not only uh, Tom and I as co-chairs, but the delegates for a particular sector so that those people are wrapped in. So this is already happening and um, 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 don't, don't uh, rely 100% just on the folks that are at the table. You're all here because you're interested. You have, you have a job to do too. Um, CWCD and ADWR during the course of the proceedings uh, are, are going to come up with ideas, as, as Director Bruchowski said before, and proposals and things like that. And we expect similar types of feedback to be income from the dele delegates, not just yay or nay to, to, to what, uh, what we say but uh, to incorporate your ideas and, and concepts and proposals into this as well. And uh, another role of the delegates, as, as we talked about before, is to attend as many of these meetings as possible. Um, and that the reason for having an alternate is so that if any one of you cannot be here, that there is someone who um, is up to speed, and that's part of your job too, to keep, to keep your alternate up to speed if they're not able to attend. And I see many alternates are here today. Thank you very much. Um, so that we will always have somebody ready to fill that chair. We would ask, however, that only the designated alternate be a fill-in. We do not want, unfortunately, to have a kind of revolving chair where somebody different shows up every time because it's really difficult for the, everybody else to kind of catch those people up. So that's why it's limited to two per delegate chair, the, the principal and the alternate. And then uh, there, every, the, the meetings are approximately every two weeks. We've got a slide on that in a minute. 
um, as we all know, a two week schedule is a treadmill and it's at a fast speed and there's going to be a lot of work that needs to happen in between each meeting, not just logistically for me and Tom and our staff to do, but for all of you as delegates to be working with your constituents and your own agency to get that done. This is um, that we can only go as fast as the slowest person. So everybody has got incumbent upon them to um, do their homework, complete their action item, their assignments and things like that so that we can all move forward as quickly as possible. As Director Bushowski said, we have a limited amount of time to do this and the lake is going down while we're doing it. I think that was the last bullet on that page. So here are the, are the, is the draft schedule for the meetings. We published this last week. Um, I think uh, most of these days are Thursday afternoons. There's one exception. I don't recall off the top of my head which one that is. It may be October 11th is a Wednesday. Um, and what this is, is it's every two weeks except we skip the week that Labor Day is in and we skip the week that Thanksgiving is in. Other than that, it's every two weeks. Uh, but those are the schedules. We do not have locations yet identified for all of them. The most critical one is August 9th and working very hard to get that one identified and we'll let folks know as soon as possible. Do we have a question? Yeah. Ted, I believe on the list, the October 11th is supposed to be the 10th, and I think that's the Wednesday. That's based on previous correspondence. Okay. We may have a typo here. We'll get that validated before the end of the, end of the meeting, uh, if that's a mistake. I know there was one Wednesday, so there's some. Thank you, Tim, for your calendar function for pointing that out to us, and we'll check and see if that's correct. Back to Tom. So we'll have a little bit of discussion now about implementing the drought contingency plan. So we're introducing kind of a new term here in this first bullet, tier zero. So again, under the 2007 guidelines, there's tier one tier at 1075, tier two, 1050, tier three at 1025. The job contingency plan adds an additional layer starting at elevation 1090 and going to 1075. Again, a reduction for Arizona in that tier, which we're now calling tier zero of 192,000 acre feet. But in looking at what's happening on the river and the modeling and projecting forward, before the end of the interim period, the end of the guidelines 2026, 2019 may well be the last year in which we are in the condition of tier zero and not already moving into tier one. And so we just wanted to share that information with you because I think it might be pertinent to uh, how folks are going to be impacted and what tools might be available to us to again partially mitigate those impacts. Um, and, and we also may need to have some discussion. So well, let me go to the next one. So there may be some processes or mechanisms that will focus primarily on the tier zero years, but we don't anticipate that that will consume a lot of the steering committee's time. Oops. What did I do here? Did I go backwards or am I going forwards? So again, we, we also recognize that one of the issues um, that will occur when we get below 1075 will be within each year that there will be water ordered uh, by folks that have Colorado River water delivered to them, whether on the river or within CAP, that won't be taken and will need to address the disposition of that water as well. Even though if we're not in tier zero, what we've known traditionally as other excess water will essentially be gone uh, as soon as we go below 1075. So we wanted to review a bit the reductions and the contributions under the guidelines and the drought contingency plan. So again, tier zero starting at elevation 1090. So again, if the drought contingency plan was in place today, we would already be implementing the 192,000 acre foot cut, what we're calling tier zero. Tier one at 1075, we add in 320,000 acre feet. So the total reduction to Arizona would be 512,000 acre feet. At tier two, another addition, 
So we now would total 592,000 acre feet. And then at 1045, another addition, uh, making the nut for Arizona 640,000 acre feet. And again, part of the uh, part of the reason that 1045 is in there specifically is again that's potentially where California uh, obligations and contributions start to kick in at 1045. And then tier three, 720,000 acre feet total for Arizona at 1025. So again, reminding folks yet again, the central focus of this steering committee will be how best to adopt and implement the job contingency plan, basically how to deal with those various reductions at various elevations and the impacts they're going to impose upon the end users of Colorado River water. So we're starting from the place that reductions under the drought contingency plan will occur in priority order within Arizona, and, and Ted will go through some of this in more detail. We've done some of this in the past couple of meetings. However, and this is really the important part, and this is really the work largely of this committee and this process, alternative approaches that conform to the existing priority system to allow reductions in use of higher priority water to flow to lower priority water users and into Lake Mead may be developed. That will be a challenge. They need to be voluntary. They need to end up in a place where we can all be in agreement that these things make sense to help spread the benefits and the obligations across the water use sectors in the state. So that, again, is our main challenge. We've included in the in the packet today uh, for the delegates, and I think there are copies too for the audience of this, uh, three um, graphic slides about the priorities in Arizona. Uh, it looks like this on the front um, that you can refer to, but we didn't want to be keeping flipping back and forth on slides, so we took it out of the slide deck. So um, to build on, on the overall summary uh, provided by Director Bushatsky of how uh, DCP would work and be implemented in Arizona. Would like to kind of peel through uh, each of the of the priorities. Um, the the first water to go um, um, uh, under DCP uh, would be the lowest lowest priority water on the river, and within the CAP priority four water. So that would be the P5 water on river and the CAP other excess pool face reductions in what we're referring to as Tier 0, 1075 to 1090. That's the tier that we're in right now. And even though the other excess pool has not completely gone away, that in those, in those deeper shortages below Tier 0, these essentially will be, will be gone. Uh, that doesn't mean that one of these um, uh, uh, voluntary agreements among parties might not allow some water to flow to these folks. This is the work that we have to do while we're, while we're here. Um, as I just said, below 1075, the pools are eliminated, not just under the DCP, but also under the, under the guidelines, which the first tier uh, reduction is 320,000 acre feet, and this other excess pool is much smaller than that. It'll essentially be gone uh, below, below 1075 in either case. The next tier is the CAP agricultural pool is next to be reduced. And really, um, it's, it's hard to do this without shuffling a lot of paper, but the, the referring to the next two pages in, of the graphs in the handout between what happens under the guidelines and what happens under DCP differentially, uh, and it's a little bit different to each, to each pool within the CAP priority system, is a good way to see well, what changes, what gets worse in most cases between the 2007 guidelines and the LBDCP for each for each pool. Um, it's not the same for everybody, and this is a point that Director Bushatsky brought up before: is that we need to acknowledge that this, the, the impacts of DCP is not the same for ev for everybody, and we need to probably do something to try and even that out a little bit better. 
So between 1075 and 1050, or what is a tier one shortage, the ag pool supply goes from approximately 50% of its supply to none under DCP. Under a tier two shortage, uh, which is 1050 to 1025 feet, the ag pool goes from a small percentage of its supply under the guidelines of about 20% to none under, under the DCP. And in a tier three, um, the ag pool has no supply at all under either the DCP or the 2007 guidelines. So if you hold those two slides side by side, you can see uh, that's, where these, that's where these numbers come from. The non-Indian ag priority pool, and I'll, I'll pause for a moment there and, and mention that uh, only a portion of the non-Indian ag priority water that's available um, under the CAP master contract is allocated at this present time. It's about 250,000 acre feet, and it is allocated to uh, two tribes and seven MNI subcontractors. Uh, but that pool, and there, there's other, then there's other allocations that are pending and other water that's available for future allocations. But for right now, we're really talking about who has this water today. Between 1075 and 1050 in a first year shortage, the NIA supply goes from a full supply under the 2007 guidelines to 80% under the tier one. So just, just implicated by about 20% reduction, differential reduction under DCP. However, between 1050 and 1025 in a tier two shortage, the non-Indian ag priority pool goes um, from full to approximately 15 to 50 percent. So there's lots of vari variability in there as the lake drops from 1050 to 1025, the, the NIA pool disappears pretty rapidly. And then under a tier three shortage, 10, 25 and below, the NIA supply goes from about 90 percent almost full under the guidelines to nothing under LBDCP. So pretty severe consequences for the NIA pool in addition to the ag pool. Next highest priority is the CAP Indian and MNI priority pools. They're co-equal, they're separate pools, but they're co-equal with each other as far as priority goes. And they are affected only at the deepest level of reduction under the DCP, uh, below, which is below 1025. So those two priority pools are not affected by a tier one or a tier two shortage at current usage levels under either the 2007 guidelines or the LBDCP. So the, these, these two pools um, are A, as I said, not affected until only the, the, the third tier when there's about a 10% reduction to those pools. So the, these really are the, are the pools that, that um, have the least impact and the, and the most benefit on a longer term basis from the DCP of slowing the, slowing the decline in the lake down before it gets to these lower, lower levels. Um, here's a graphical representation of this, what we call the CAP priority stack. There's a picture of this in the handout that I referred to before. Uh, highest priority at the bottom, there's a tiny amount of priority three water, tiny in, in relatively. Uh, and then the Indian and MNI priority pools side by side shown there. The non-Indian ag pool, non-Indian ag priority pool, the agricultural settlement pool, and then other excess at the top. The horizontal dashed line there represents the first tier shortage that, uh, that would occur under DCP, which is the 320,000 under the guidelines plus an additional 192,000 acre feet under DCP. And these are examples. We've got that word up there on the slide on purpose. These are examples. There's lots of other, well, could this happen? Could that happen? There's lots of things that could happen. And this, this first um, representation here is probably the simplest ones. If we just were to um, take the tier one shortage under DCP, in, in priority order from lowest priority to highest, this is the way that it would look. As we said before, it would eliminate the other excess pool entirely. It would em eliminate the ag pool entirely, and it would reduce the NIA priority pool by about 20% based on existing usage levels. Um, so if, if we were to have DCP and just went strictly 
against pri uh, in priority order, this is what it would look like. Uh, one of the questions that we need to resolve here is this the acceptable manner to implement DCP in, in Arizona? Um, uh, we don't know, likely not, uh, but that will be the discussion for this committee here. It's likely that we will have to come up with, as Director Buchowski said, some, a series of a number of agreements among the parties about how to do this differently. And there's an example, one example of, of many possible examples on the right here. And so what this represents is a situation where there have been some voluntary agreements by higher priority water users, which is represented by the, the, the blue sections in the top part of the graph, who have decided to do some conservation, either system conservation or intentionally created surplus, and make some water available to leave in Lake Mead. But in the course of doing so, the assumption in this graph is that there was a discussion among the lower priority water users who agreed that some of that water that was released or conserved by the higher priority users would be made available to lower priority users, and that's why there's a little bit of green ag pool being shown down there below the line, which is what's delivered. This is just one example of what could happen, but the key concept here is, as Director Buschowski said, all of the priority pools are going to have to agree that this is the way that this can work so that we can get the consensus to go to the legislature and get this program approved. How the exact mechanics of each agreement that will be done will differ from agreement to agreement, but the overall premise is, as we discussed before, is using the priority system, respecting the priority system to allow these type of transactions to happen. And we'll spend lots more time in subsequent meetings on this. So before, this is pretty heavy stuff. So before we move on, if there's anybody that wants to ask any questions about this, we can do that. Bill? Uh, yes, Ted, just one general question. So absent some secondary agreements to how to move water around within a, a reduction within a priority, is that just a proportional um, sharing of that cut to those priority users or? Yeah, I believe I believe so. Yes, it's just pro rata. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, a question for or Ted or, or Tom on the M and I tribal or Indian priority and M and I priority. Have all the contracts been updated so that that is the case? Because I thought there were still some outstanding contracts where um, there was some there was a different sort of priority system within that pool. There are some different priorities, and I know particularly associated with the tribal contracts. Yes, yeah, um, what I was thinking. The ones negotiated and pursuant to settlements have different shortage sharing criteria. Right. Okay, thanks, Leslie. And if I may, just as a request, that, which might be helpful for those of us, some of us who are dealing with multiple entities within our sector, is there a document somewhere that lists all the subcontracts, con well, subcontracts are easy, but all the contracts and where they fall in the relative priority system? I'm sure there's some version of something yeah. like that, but, but certainly this would be something that would be useful for us to have, I so we'll so. make sure that we have an updated version of that available. Unfortunately, the, the priority system that's depicted on this graph isn't all in one compact little place in a single document that says, here's how the priorities work. There's some of it is here, some of it is there, some of it is here, some of it is there. But okay. we can compile all that into something. Thank you. I think that would be really helpful for everybody to have and be able to see. Okay. A couple of questions. Um, concerning some of, the, uh, some of the potential solutions that are out there, uh, does it also include perhaps recovery of water already stored? or say an MNI subcontractor who would otherwise forgo deliveries to a lower priority user to actually take water from storage? Is that one of the potentials? I, I, and I'm, I'm sure Director Bushatsky will, will expand upon this a little bit. If what you're talking about is firming, um, probably not because we won't be getting down into, into those water bank firming. Uh, but certainly any other any other type of, of uh, um, 
moving thing moving things around respecting the priority system um, it, it will, will be something that we need to, to look at and the other thing is something just, specific in, in well, I was just you know looking at the different water at least at the water bank whatever stored in the, in the three different AMAs Penal for example has you know 1.4 million acre feet in storage and it whatever the regulatory limitations it might be on using that water it's certainly water that was intended to use in times of shortage and if we were sort of creating sort of a, a I'll call it a voluntary shortage if you will to, to keep a shortage from happening sort of a re reduction that you know maybe that would be a reason I know we're not changing existing agreements and, and that's probably not the direction but that was just a thought I had and then the other thing is more of a an observation when we talk we start talking about what we have to do to sort of forge some solutions here it would be nice to know not just the percentages of water of the delta between what would happen in the event of a shortage versus what would happen under DCP it would be nice to know what the volume Quantities, of water we're right. dealing with so we can see how that would you know shake out at the end of the day so so I'll, I'll just stand bill that <clears throat> the water banking authority has water stored for water management purposes maybe there's some flexibility there I would suggest that you might sit with uh, the water banking executive director Virginia O'Connell and maybe talk about your idea a little bit and maybe crystallize a proposal that uh, might work again knowing though that uh, if you use that water for those purposes it won't be there for other purposes and there might be other implications for other obligations of the bank but I think that might be something you can flesh out with Virginia and not to get too too far ahead of, of your your question uh, either bill but there are other other um, considerations for instance state of Arizona CWCD ICS there's about 300,000 acre feet in Lake Mead that's a resource that's available us to use for some of these solutions there's uh, Lake Pleasant is relatively full as far as the operational um, space uh, there so those are there's those those types of things that ought to, that we need to consider too that can be resources for us to to do um, some of these um, agreements I'll make this my last comment on this but there's also a time element to perhaps and I'm not going to speak on behalf of Paul here to my left but you know the ag pool water uh, was was scheduled to go down in 20 24 I believe to 225 and to zero in 2030 so there's a time element to what solutions might be put on the table as it relates to trying to mitigate the effects of that on the ag on the uh, ag pool water so um, you know, I, I guess we have to bear that in mind whatever solutions that that might be sort of a you might look at it on a longer basis it might seem imprudent but to get through this time period through 2030 it might be at least something to consider so thank you that, that that's a that's a good point even though even though the these graphs for instance as examples appear to be a static thing there might be something that are fixed quantities there might be some things that are on a sliding scale they might have some variable or index that that we agree to to use um, but the whole purpose of this is to find something that will work that gives all of us enough certainty that it will still work it needs to be sustainable in a couple three four years be, between now and 2026. If there are, <clears throat> if there are individual contracts or arrangements that were more flexible than the rigidity, of, you know, of a visual, mm -hmm. how and when does that get worked out in order to put the plan together? I mean, would they? Is there some listing, or would various sectors bring that that flexibility together? Um, well, the, the this forum is the main place where I think that that work is to be done. But uh, and, as, and as long as you brought it up, Representative Bowers, um, something that we didn't mention earlier is that we expect a fair amount of work to go on outside this room. And as we'll get to later in the agenda, there's one specific um, work group that has been going on that we're, we're going to ask to come and present to the steering committee next time. 
Um, so as proposals um, or ideas are generated outside of this room, we want them to be brought back here so that we can make sure that there's a there's a thorough discussion. So I guess uh, it's, I'm not intending to be to be dismissive, but anywhere and everywhere that concepts can be can be um, generated about how to do some of these things, or all those ideas are welcome. And, and it would be intuitive that a lot of that's probably already being done. Some work has been done. Now, we didn't just start on any of this yesterday, even though this is the first meeting of the steering committee and only the third meeting in, in this round of discussions. A lot of work has been put into these concepts already. And, and to add Representative Bowers, the OBR and CWCD will work together addressing the resources that are under our purview, so to speak, to throw out some potential solutions as well. But we can't do it all ourselves. We don't have enough resources at our disposal to fully deal with those impacts. And like Ted said, we, we hope that others have uh, that have resources bring proposals to us. So we'll be both the chairs making proposals, but you all, with help from your constituencies out in the audience as well, coming forth with proposals. So we wanted to uh, have a little bit of a discussion of what we see as the four essential elements uh, for implementing the drought contingency plan. And those have been identified by DWR and CAWCD. Uh, and we're considering these as some of the tools that can be used to implement the DCP in Arizona. Uh, when we were developing these tools, we did kind of consider the technical analysis of the impacts that Ted just went through and also the political realities of getting to the joint resolution that we need from the Arizona legislature in 2019. And we have focused on what we think is needed and possible within the next eight meetings or so. Again, we've already covered this, but we are certainly interested in all of your ideas. Again, but we want the tools to be focused on mitigating, again, the differential impacts of the drought contingency plan and, and sustaining collaborative processes within Arizona. Again, the differential impacts of this plan on top of the 2007 guideline shortages, which are already in play when we get to those tier levels. And unless we do something here, uh, they will be uh, implemented in priority the way the left-hand column of Ted's slide showed. So to go through the elements uh, one by one, the first is CAP Ag mitigation. Again, the CAP Ag pool faces reductions under the DCP but receives limited benefits. And as we go through these, keep in mind each one of these topics requires significantly more definition and discussion than we, in, we know we have time to get to today. We will definitely work through each one of these with all of you uh, and hear your ideas and concepts that emerge, again, focusing on our ultimate objective and mission of the steering committee. And Ted mentioned earlier that a lot of this is not new. There's been discussion of these things for quite a while now within Arizona in various venues. The second one is tribal intentionally created surplus. Again, currently the non-Indian agricultural pool, as Ted said, is largely held by CAP tribes with settlements of their water rights. This tool can provide flexibility for the management of supplies provided from the settlements and also for on-river entitlements, folks who have the right to do ICS there as well. Um, next, a CAP excess water plan. Should try to continue the collaborative approach to achieving multiple benefits from the CAP excess water supply. 
the CAP excess water supply is the major, major contributor to the tier zero reductions. And again, that supply has historically gone to the replenishment district for the replenishment function performed by CWCD, the Arizona Water Banking Authority, and to the federal government in part for their Indian firming obligations under the 2004 Water Settlement Act. So it is a very important pool to a large number of water users, uh, and we need to address ways to deal with the loss of that water as well. And then last of the four major elements in Arizona Conservation Plan, a new collaborative process to foster broader participation to help meet the DCP reductions. Ted mentioned a little bit before about the ability to conserve water, as system conservation or intentionally created surplus, and that creating some opportunities to help mitigate CEP ag or excess water or whatever we might decide to do and whatever those who have that water and are doing the conservation would be willing to share and put together in a plan. Tom, <clears throat> Tom, yes. Can I quibble a little bit uh, with the first bullet point? And I know this this isn't time to really uh, worry about uh, drafting nuances, but um, the CEP Ag Pool faces reductions under the 2007 guidelines. Something we recognize are not subject to any kind of mitigation plan. We face elimination under the lower basin. Uh, drought contingency plan. So I, I, I think that first bullet point kind of understates the problem for us a bit. And again, not wanting to quibble, but there are, there are also uh, potential outcomes under the drought, under the 2007 guidelines where the ag pool goes completely away as well. It's not just under the drought contingency plan. But again, we, we want to work through this to see if we can again, mitigate those incremental impacts that would fall upon the ag pool if the drought contingency plan is put into place. And largely, that's what this process is about, including these other three elements. Go back again. So again, DWR and CODC have identified the general contours of these elements uh, consistent with the ground rules we discussed earlier. Um, we need addi additional definition and detail developed through this steering committee process. So we propose actually to start with CAP ag pool mitigation. Um, we do believe and we are very optimistic, Ted and I, that we can develop some of these collaborative agreements to meet the approaches and the goals that we've outlined, our shared objectives, and to avoid conflicts that have derailed our efforts in the past. We are proposing to start with the CEP Ag Pool mitigation and then follow up with uh, tribal intentionally created surplus. And while DWR and CEP have not been involved, we are aware that there are some ag CEP Ag mitigation discussions taking place among mm -hmm. some parties and we want to give them an opportunity to come back and share their progress if they desire. Uh, and we want to ask you to do that at the next meeting. Um, we also want everyone to know that some tribal ICS discussions have been going on, uh, and we intend to bring uh, the results or at least an update on where we are in that process uh, soon as we have an opportunity to work through some more of those issues. So that's kind of a preview of where we're going uh, and what we think we can address early on in this process. Again, first focusing on CAP Ag mitigation. I think that's indicative, Paul, in my mind of what you described earlier as the bulk of the, the uh, uh, impacts occurring. And let's get right to it for probably the, the biggest issue or at least the biggest impact in the near term, knowing, of course, that the NIA pool users are also heavily impacted by 
the DCP. But at least in the situation of the NI pool members, many of them have multiple resources, not just one resource like CAP Ag has, at least in terms of renewable water supplies. So it Concerning um, ag pool, um, it would be helpful, I think, to see a breakdown of uh, how much of the ag pool is in each of the AMAs. I think Pinal is roughly 75 percent, and the solutions that might work in Pinal could be significantly different, perhaps, than than the Tucson and the, and the Phoenix AMA. So if you could see maybe in one of the presentations coming forward, it would be helpful, I think. And so, Bill, we will, we will do that, um, keeping in mind that some of the creative solutions might involve uh, shifting where the ag pool might end up, the physical molecules of cholera in the ag pool might end up. And so just keep that in mind as we look at where the current percentages are in each active management area. And that, that's a good suggestion. We will have that information next time because that's relevant to the, will be relevant to that discussion. And I'd like to also point out that um, that uh, the the ag pool uh, uh, is currently at 300,000 acre acre feet. That is not being fully used. A large portion of it is being conserved under the now f count them five ag conservation programs that we have going on. So that we'll provide that information as well. Is that uh, what's available, what's being used, what's being conserved, by whom, where, the, all of that information, so that we have that for that conversation next time. Um, um, we, we uh, Tom and I talked earlier about we had a break scheduled. It was much earlier in the agenda than where we're at right now. And we, we did have, it's not on the agenda, but we did have one optional thing that we wanted to do if time permitted. And I've got to tell you, it looks like time is going to permit. So what we will suggest now is that we take our scheduled break uh, for, uh, say, 15 minutes. Uh, people can use facilities, make phone calls. So let's be back at um, 25 mm -hmm. after. But what, what we will do when we get back, and this optional thing is we are going to allow the delegates to have a few minutes, maybe spend a half an hour or so, and now that we've kind of set the table, to have any comments about what your expectations or, or goals might be for this process so that we can make sure that Tom and I and our staff anticipate that as we go forward. And then that will still leave us time, some time for the call of the public and public comment after and next steps after we come back, okay? Thank you.
Testing. Test. Testing one, two. Yeah, just because. Testing one, two. Yeah. Okay. So, obviously.
Okay, folks, we're getting ready to start up again. So let's do next steps first and then move to this delegate team. Is that all right? Yep. seats, including the delegates, because we'll be moving into an opportunity for the delegates to give their views. Should be a judge or something. Yeah, just yell. I'm used to yelling at my kids. 20 years of yelling at my kids. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you, everyone. Well, we're almost ready to go. Before we move to the delegate um, input and then a call to the public, well, let's just briefly cover the next steps. What happens after this meeting? Um, I apologize for not doing this before I draw your attention to the last line on the slide that's on the screen right now. Um, that yes, we do have Wi-Fi here and we mentioned earlier that the materials are posted on the CAP and ADWR websites uh, earlier, but we neglected to tell people what the password for the Wi-Fi network is here. Uh, I didn't even know this, but the Wi-Fi, it's, it's called CAP Guest is the name of the um, of the network that'll show up on your phone or your computer, and the password is Fleet Space Tango. I'm sorry, Fleet Space Evolve Space Tango. This just sounds like the CIA or something. Um, it's kind of late in the meeting, but you can you can get those uh, documents uploaded if you want to. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next steps. Our next meeting will be August 9th. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the location is TBD, but we will have that nailed down as soon as possible. It won't be in some remote corner of the state somewhere. It'll be um, here in Maricopa County somewhere. <laughs> somewhere near DWR. Yeah. Um, and what, what, needs to, what needs to happen between now and, and then is that, as we discussed earlier, delegates, engaging with their constituents and vice versa uh, to discuss what we've discussed today and get input on that uh, because what we'd like to do at the next meeting is we'll have some space on the agenda to have any kind of dialogue that we need to have to answer questions or uh, clear up any, any um, uh, differences of opinion on those things next time. Uh, we've got a lot of questions um, uh, since this whole process started and even before. When will the delegates and the public be able to look at the DCP documents? For a long time we referred to the term sheet. The term sheet is being converted into real legal documents at this point in time and that group has been working uh, two days, a w full days a week of uh, attorneys from uh, among the three lower basin state uh, um, organizations to get that done. And we will be um, seeking to get um, permission from that group to provide those documents as soon as possible, hopefully before the next meeting. At the next meeting, we hope to receive input from the delegates on the process uh, we'll, we'll, to the extent we don't cover all of that today get a presentation on CAP Ag Mitigation from the group of delegates that have been working on that. As Tom mentioned earlier, um, uh, there is there is more work, I think, just to do to prepare for that. So we may get a start on that and finish up at the meeting after that and have other topics uh, to address at the next meeting as, as well. I did want to take a moment, too, to recognize another elected official who has joined us this afternoon. It's Terry Rambler, who's the chairman of the San Carlos Apache Tribe. Thank you for coming today. So let's move on now then to 
we discussed before the break, we'd like a chance for the delegates to have a couple of moments to express any um, aspirations, hopes, goals, concerns about this process briefly um, so that uh, Tom and I can incorporate that into our planning for the next meeting and the next sessions. We would like to begin with the legislative representatives. I know we didn't give you a forewarning of that, um, but uh, we'd like to start with the legislative representatives and then we'll just continue around the circle going this way. Okay, I should probably allow for seniority, so I would like to offer uh, Senator Griffin um, the opportunity to speak first. Um, so last year, uh, there were several bills that came through the legislature, and I think uh, we lost some very important time. Um, even though uh, steps weren't taken um, to move uh, what I would consider to be um, productive legislation forward, there was a lot of very good conversations. Um, there was a even more education done at the legislature between the two chambers. And that is something that I think is really, really imperative um, in order to move uh, the DCP forward. We need to make sure that both of our chambers are well versed, how it affects their constituents, um, their legislative districts. So with that, I look forward to working with my colleagues on helping to uh, educate the other legislators that may not be present or may be viewing this because we all know when it comes to water, um, there's a lot of depth that needs to be uh, captured when it comes to knowledge. So I look forward to uh, presenting uh, some solid legislation to move DC, DCP forward in Arizona. I think it's... Uh, imperative because Arizona has a fantastic history with water um, and I would much rather we do it um, and uh, no offense Leslie better us than the feds so uh, with that um, I look forward to working with the steering committee thank you I too uh, am thankful for being here and yes we had a lot of legislation that um, proposed legislation last year but we're here for the DCP and want to concentrate on this issue uh, we're continuing our our meetings throughout the state on the other issues that we have uh, our next meeting is the 17th of August in, in Greenlee County uh, and we will continue that but we're here right now on this very important issue and I'm really pleased that the ag mitigation is number one on the list I think that's really important as as others so thank you. I thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's very important. Well, it is important that we're here, and I'm and I'm uh, very grateful that we are sitting at this table. But there is a lot of voices that are lacking around this table. So I'm I, I'm hoping that. Uh, as the steering committee moves forward that we listen to all voices and I'm so glad that this these meetings are public uh, and as uh, Senator uh, Atondo had, had said is is bringing a a very um, agreeable agree, um, resolution to the legislature uh, the when it comes to water policy um, I would say that uh, a lot of legislators need to be educated and so and how important water is and how when, com when it comes to the DCP that we um, do come to, to pr and not, not everyone's going to be um, satisfied, but I'm hoping that the majority of the concerns are, are talked about and are agreed upon, and that I'm very appreciative to Senator Griffin and Representative Bowers that they are going around the state of Arizona to listen to um, John Q. Public out there that is being impacted by uh, our water sustainability and I look forward to um, moving um, forward 
so that when the legislature does move in January, that we do have an agreement and that it is going to be bipartisan. Thank you. Use my microphone. Um, hey, I'd like to thank the governor, and I'd like to thank uh, uh, Tom and Ted uh, for implementing this forum again. I know it has you've made extreme efforts in the past to try to educate people to the situation. The challenge that I see for us uh, not only is upgrading the educational level of the legislators to take these decisions, but that we have 15 new members coming into the House and probably a few senators the same. And so um, we are implementing an educational program uh, to bring our House members up to speed and invite others who wish to be there as well. To start a 101, um, grateful to Gina and her help that way, and we uh, we invite um, anyone who wishes to be there to make sure that any necessary or critical information that, that they should be informed of can be given. I know it's the, the time is will be very restricted, but we look forward to that and to add that to what other comments have been said by our particular segment. We're, we're very grateful to be involved, and we thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the business community, uh, Glenn Hammer, uh, Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, in a past life, I worked for Senator Kyle, and he must have said about a thousand times, water's economic development. And I would echo uh, the comments made earlier today. We'd much rather take action in the state of Arizona than to have the federal government take action. And this is a serious time. And I think I believe the state of Arizona could, should be very proud of itself. But I don't believe that there's a state in the country that has done more over the course of its history to prepare for difficult times. And we're in a we're in one of those periods right now. And our goal is to help uh, our friends in the legislature, however we can so that uh, we get a, a, a good and fair uh, plan and resolution through the legislature. And uh, we're going to continue our efforts to help uh, educate uh, the public, uh, as well as uh, assist in any efforts we can uh, in terms of uh, with the legislature, so that we could build uh, the, pu the public support uh, necessary to, uh, to make sure that this is a successful process. And I just uh, want to also conclude by saying uh, I deeply appreciate the opportunity to participate in what I believe will be a, a historic effort. Thank you. On behalf of the Central Arizona Project Board and the three counties that each of our 15 members of the board represent and our staff, I am very happy that CAP is hosting this first meeting. Uh, we appreciate everyone being here, and uh, it is important that I say for the record that we've long recognized, CAP has long recognized, the risk of shortage and have been proactive in our efforts as an organization to help reduce that risk. So we're pleased to be here rolling up our sleeves with everybody else. We think the time is right, and we appreciate everyone's efforts toward putting an agreement in place uh, to address DCP. Thank you all. And following on uh, the heels of, uh, of my fellow board member, uh, Lisa, um, it's true that the CAP board fully supports the drought contingency plan. We are really grateful to have this conversation and start this work today. And, and it was noted, it's not starting the work because a lot of work has been done, but this is really a milestone day to bring everybody together. Um, and so appreciate everybody coming here. And I will just observe that the energy and the, the you know, the, the, the good tone in this room is, is noticeable. Um, and it's really important. And I think it will uh, um, lead us to a successful conclusion and what's my expectation is my expectation is we will be successful. And this, um, you know, the next uh, few months ahead of us is going to be a lot of work, but I think everybody's uh, here and ready, so I'm very optimistic. And, again, appreciate everybody being here and look forward to, uh, to working with everybody.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hunter Moore. I represent Governor Doug Ducey uh, on this committee. I'd first like to congratulate uh, Tom and Ted for putting together such an impressive group of leaders. I believe right now there is a time that needs leadership, and we're very grateful to each one of you for stepping up. I know that each one of you will vigorously represent your interests and the, the constituencies that you have, and we encourage that. Um, I would like to say a, a very special thank you to the legislators who have taken time to sit with Tom and Ted and to listen to what the situation currently is, to ask questions, and if there have not been appropriate answers, I'd like to uh, also thank Tom and Ted for taking the time to go and get the information and to share it with us. I have had the privilege of uh, attending several of the other meetings that take place aside from this group to work on DCP with staff um, from CAWCD, people from Arizona, engaging with the other basin states, with Mexico, with the federal government. There is a great benefit to working with them on this topic because it takes most of the intense pressure off of Arizona solely. It does give us some help. That is one of the best outcomes that can come from DCP is that we have partnership from Mexico. We have partnership from California. We have partnership from some of the other basin states who can help alleviate what would be very difficult to do on our own. We at the governor's office recognize that that does not come without some difficulty for everyone. And we want to work through those topics and those issues as carefully, but also as quickly as we can. This is a very serious time. These are very serious issues that have not just come upon us all at once. We have been blessed with great foresight from our predecessors. And now is our opportunity together to take on some of these challenges, which are unique to our time. We're very grateful for the work that has been done by both the organizations who le are leading this. We will continue to engage with them. Uh, but thank you very much, and I'm uh, looking forward to the next meeting. I'm sure that many of you had have had a chance to hear our Commissioner Brenda Berman speak uh, both at the June 28th meeting and numerous other times about the importance of drought contingency planning. Uh, the Bureau of Reclamation is um, dedicated absolutely not only to contingency planning but the proactive mitigation that's taken place so far and the proactiveness in the planning for the future uh, results of drought in the basin. We are here in Arizona and proud to be a part of this process. Um, we're committed to working with all of the stakeholders and the tribes specifically to help move this forward and to do anything we can to support you all throughout this. I didn't, I didn't realize that we were going to be included, but I guess that's okay uh, because we called this whole thing together. I think it, it's pretty clear what, what uh, we, we, what our expectations are and what our hopes are. I agree with everything that's been said as, as far as uh, the expectation and the vision for the outcome of the work that this committee will do is success. Um, uh, Tom and I have had many conversations about how to try and make that happen. And one, and one, one a key element for me of that is, is to recognize how much solution space that we do have. There's lots of room to do what we need to do to get this done. And, and to do that by avoiding staying out there in the margins where um, trouble is. We don't need to do that. There's lots of room in between those type of things. And that's where I plan to be. Uh, and I would encourage everyone else to have that same mindset, and we can do this work. It will be hard, and it's a lot of work, but we can do it. So I've done quite a bit of talking already, but I do just want to thank Ted and his staff for all the work that's gone into this process so far, and especially my own staff. Um, you can probably imagine how, work, how much work this is, but unless you're sitting in the room, for the many hours that this is happening, you probably don't really appreciate how 
much work goes into this, both from our staff and from Ted and his staff. So we are committed and, uh, to continuing to do that, and I know my staff is extremely committed to uh, not having a life outside of DWR to make this happen. Uh, again, David Godleski, Southern Arizona Home Builders. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how the seat assignments were made, and so my top priority is convincing a fellow steering committee member to take the seat to the right of the director. Um, but in, in, in all seriousness, uh, I want to th thank uh, DWR and, and CAP for uh, bringing this uh, steering committee together and for, uh, for your leadership on, on this important issue. Um, I'm honored to be a, a part of this, this process. There are a lot of great minds who are around the, around the table, and I'm, I'm confident in the direction that we're going to go. Uh, and, and plan on being a, a positive contributor to this, this process. Um, I think uh, uh, Glenn hit a very important point in talking about the, uh, the role of water in economic development, um, and we're, we're making a lot of, of, of progress uh, in this state in terms of, of uh, our economic recovery, and we also have done a trem tremendous amount uh, to ensure that we have sound uh, water uh, management and policy in place. Uh, I know it was touched on um, before, but, but in looking at uh, economic development and specifically the role of the GRD in, uh, in, in helping advance our, our economy, I think that's going to be an important topic, uh, especially when you're looking at uh, the impact of, of uh, the loss of excess water on the GRD. And so I look forward to a, a discussion and related to, uh, to a plan uh, for that and uh, certainly look forward to the future meetings and working with my fellow uh, committee members. Well, one thing I'd like to say for sure in starting out is, um, for one, being involved in this process, but two, thanking everyone that's here and sitting around this table because obviously um, agriculture is not in a good spot. And without everyone's work here and everyone's involvement and willing to, willingness to come up with new ideas, um, you know, if everybody were to walk away, we'd be stuck with what we have, which isn't very good. So agriculture is a $23 billion industry and over 60% of agriculture sales in our state survive off of this river, whether it's on river or off of CAP. And so we have a, a very, very vested interest in seeing some kind of successful outcome um, from this process. I think that for those of the, you that know folks in agriculture, we are generational thinkers. And so we are more than willing to be involved in this process and try to fix what's happening because you know, there is no agriculture without a healthy river and a healthy lake. And recognizing that we will feel some pain in this process, but again, thanking those of you that are, that are willing to, um, to contribute ideas and, uh, and different um, plans that can be put into place. Specifically for Farm Bureau, we have, we have growers in Mojave County, La Paz County, Yuma County, Maricopa County, Pima County, and I think our goal specifically here is to be able to contribute to the, the agricultural discussion with, with all of our growers and all of our members because we happen to have members that are of the most lowest priority and members that are at the absolute highest priority. And so that presents some challenges for us within the sector. But I feel confident that we'll be able to um, contribute to the discussion in a productive way. And I'm just very happy to be here. Thank you. Okay. I, too, am very happy to be part of this process. Um, as you know, the, the Water Bank has been, uh, over the last 20 years, um, storing water underground to try to mitigate um, shortages, you know, on the Colorado. And we've stored over 3.6 million acre feet of water. But I think there's probably more the Water Bank can do. Um, to assist in, in this process, and I look f uh, forward to working with Bill and others on ideas for doing that. So, thank you. I don't have comments. I have questions. Hi, Ted. <laughs> for you first. 
What's different this time around than the last several years, and why should we feel optimistic about it going to happen? What's different this time around is success. And um, I'm convinced that if we, if we share that joint vision, that we will, we will have it this time. Um, I, don't, I don't forget if it was Henry Ford or somebody else that said, or maybe it was Thomas Edison or maybe both of them, about, about uh, 10,000, the 10,000 things that you need to do first, I'm really screwing this up. The 10,000 times that you, that you do something first is just a demonstration of the ways that it doesn't work so that you can find the one that does. Maybe that's what we've got going on here. One thing I remember about Henry Ford, he, he said, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. <laughs> Mr. Wachowski, what's different this time around? Why do you think we're going to be successful when we haven't been in the past and we failed pretty miserably? So wait, a couple things. First, um, the size of this group and the, the broader representation across the state and with our legislators is something that was quite different than the last time. It's more of a ground-up process from the ground up. Also, I think... Um, it is evident from the, the recent hydrology and information we've seen, some of it today, some of it in prior meetings, that the hammer is closer and closer to coming down on our heads, and we're uh, closer and closer to the need to get this done. So I think that will help drive this process forward to a successful conclusion. Thank you. Representative Bowers. What will have to be in a package that you can get through the House? We're going to be in negotiations with Sonora to annex Yuma. <laughs> I think we'll prosper either way. <laughs> That's right. We both need you. That's the problem. We both need you. What do we need to be in a DCP? Well, I think the idea, and I've, it's not like we haven't spent a lot of hours, not as many as many of you. And that is an absolute fact. Many of you have spent a lot of energy on this issue. But we represent uh, 30 different districts and two different major parties and a lot of ideologies, but all of us have to drink water. And I think if we look through this, and it's been heartening to see a recognition that all parties are going to have to take a little pain rather than one party gets pain and it's out the window, and then the next party gets pained as the rate, rate gets lower. So that there is a spreading of the challenge among everyone, among all parties, but, it, but it also a recognition that all parties have an importance. I mean, the supervisor from Mojave, they have very important interests as well. And the rural Arizona, as we are finding out, have very unique challenges that we never talk about, but that their membership will be representing. So as we recognize, both in our traveling show and as this committee works with all parties, as we recognize that everyone has an interest, everybody has an, an importance, and there has to be a balance that we're striving for, and as close as we can get to that balance, the better success we have. If it's imbalanced, it's pretty hard to sell. Thank you. Senator Griffin, what do you think we need to do in order to get a package that can get through the Senate? I think the members sitting around the table have a lot to contribute. Uh, one size doesn't fit all, and what we do has to be a win-win uh, with everybody giving a little bit. And uh, I think the momentum is there. I think the interest is there. We can have a good, sound environment, and we can have a healthy Economy at the same time. Uh, it all 
balances out with water, however. And um, I think just the participation and the openness is go, will go a long way this time. Thank you very much. Paul? Are you asking me that same question or? <laughs> my, own, my own. I yield the balance of the meeting to you. <laughs> Uh, Paul Orm, uh, Pinell County Agriculture. Um, I'm, frankly, much more optimistic uh, this time for several reasons. One is uh, I certainly applaud the, uh, uh, the efforts of uh, the joint efforts of the department and CAP to work together to find solutions. I always felt that was an absolute requirement uh, to solve the uh, ag mitigation issue, which is, of course, my primary issue. Um, we need both agencies. We need the people in both agencies uh, working in the same direction. And so I'm optimistic that uh, that's what we have. Um, secondly, I appreciate the fact that the ag mitigation issue has uh, been elevated to a, a seemingly prominent position in these discussions. I don't think that had occurred before. So uh, I'm grateful for, uh, uh, for that. Um, this issue is uh, critically important uh, to the livelihoods of over 300 farm families in Pinell County. And um, they face an imminent threat, not a long-term threat. They face an imminent threat. And, um, um, and not only those families, but uh, frankly, the economy of Pinell County as well, if, uh, if this thing goes wrong. So, uh, um, you know, I'm, I applaud the way this, this, this effort is starting. I think it is substantially different than what we've seen in the past, and uh, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. Lois Wakimoto, Mojave County, and I am grateful to be here to represent, as Representative Bauer said, special needs of all the different areas. As we talk about economic development, I am glad that we are considering economic development of all the counties and everything that we can do to continue to produce that. Joe Olson in Metro Water District. Arizona's long history of water leadership has continued to be enriched with various collaborative and innovative solutions among all sectors. One of the most recent ones that I'm sure many of you are aware of is the inter AMA firming agreements between the City of Tucson and the City of Phoenix and Metro Water. It's my hope that these exact type of innovative and collaborative solutions is what will be used to address the four essential elements that were discussed today. And I am very optimistic on a, of this positive outcome, not just because the professionals and leadership around this table, not just because the joint leadership of Ted and Tom, but because the interest and all the expertise that's in the audience and those who are watching remotely at home. I believe that this will be hopefully a holistic approach to address these multiple and varied needs, and I'm privileged to serve on this committee. Thank you. Uh, Bill Garfield, Arizona Water Company. Um, I'm going to sound like I was, I'm actually representing the agriculture sector here when I told you earlier I was representing the municipal sector, but I've been around long enough to know uh, what life was like uh, before CAP. Um, down in Pinal, it was, it was not a good situation in the early 80s before CAP was introduced. I really don't want to see what it would be like without having CAP delivered. To that area. So um, I think if we are able to resolve and mitigate in large part uh, the impact of DCP on agriculture, I think we will be also resolving some of the joint impacts to the municipal side, the development side of the business that I represent. And if we're not able to solve that, we all share the same water supplies in, in, in all of our areas. Uh, probably the effects of this, uh, if we're not able to resolve the the ag, uh, the impacts on ag, I think Pinal will will feel it more than other areas. Uh, the governor's uh, group uh, over the past year, uh, of which I was part of, spent considerable time trying to deal uh, and find solutions to so water supply issues that we face that can. Uh, could hinder growth and development of the state and, and certainly our service areas. 
So I, I really do think it's it's important for us, critically important for us to resolve these issues sooner rather than later. And I, I do think there's a tremendous need to do that. Uh, I thank Tom and Ted for assembling the steering committee. I am uh, honored to be part of this and will certainly provide uh, all efforts that I can to find solutions for the problems we face. Thank you. Uh, Troy Day with Epcor Water. We are here as one of the many M and I subcon subcontractor entities, and I'm very comfortable to say that uh, we believe ag is also important. This, the discussions that go forward from this point can't be us versus them. It can't be the haves versus the have-nots. Um, I believe we have all the tools at our disposal to mitigate some of the impacts of the DCP. EPCOR very much agrees with the importance of the DCP in, in, in implementing the DPC, and I just stand here committed to uh, being part of the solution. Um, Javier Sedovich with the City of Goodyear. Um, so I just want to echo some of the things that have been said, but maybe add a little bit more. I mean, we're really here to contribute to the economic vitality of Arizona as well as the sustainability. And um, one of the things that's just jumped at me as I looked at some of the graphs is that um, if we take the stand of protecting some special interests along the way, all, all we're going to do is really um, create some sort of temporary success for different sectors. But overall, it is eminent that the failure will be common. So we're here to, I think, uh, make it work for all of us. Kathy Rawl with the City of Scottsdale. And the City of Scottsdale is very honored to be a part of this group as well. And um, we, as part of the, the Valley Municipalities, uh, know the importance of DCP and of all of us coming together and getting a solution and having that settled across the board with, with all of us feeling a bit of the pain, but all of us being successful in this. Thank you. Tim, Tom, you're Tucson Water. Uh, I'd also like to thank you for including us and uh, especially thank you for the thoughtful inclusion of significant representation from Southern Arizona. Uh, this is a very refreshing uh, look around the room and uh, I want to commend you for doing so and we'll do our best to, uh, to honor that with uh, reaching solutions. I do want to take one step back to the ground rules. Um, in order to fully commit to those ground rules, I want to uh, mention one thing, you know, with the focus on issues related to getting DCP done, I can fully commit to that, but I would like to caution us that when we declare victory on the DCP, our work is not done in the water space. There are significant groundwater issues in the state. There are significant issues related to reclaim water and effluent. Many of those issues will still need to come to the legislature, and we're not engaging in a thorough discussion of that at this time. So I can set aside those issues and go all in on DCP, but I can't set them aside for long. And uh, I'd just like to caution us all that we're going to be right back here uh, talking about the next steps. I would say that the, the bright side of that is when we have some more tools, flexibility, and certainty related to reclaim water or effluent and groundwater, it enables the implementation of the agreements that we're going to come to. So when we are at this table and we're agreeing to certain things related to the Colorado River, it's with the hope and understanding that there will be tools in the toolbox to help us um, uh, step up to the plate. I will close with saying that Tucson Water is happy to host any of these sessions in the future. <laughs> Hello, Laura Grignano. Um, I am honored and greatly appreciative to be representing the CAGRD on this committee. As you all know, the CAGRD plays a vital role in the state's community and economic development, and as well as Arizona's groundwater management. The GRD does rely on excess water, as well as uh, pending NIA supplies. That will be significantly impacted by DCP, but I am confident that this process will provide creative partnerships to move the state forward on this important issue. Thank you. I'm 
Shane Leonard, Roosevelt Water Conservation District. I had some wonderful comments prepared, and then Wade had to turn it into a deposition. Um, <laughs> this is going to be fun. The idea, first and foremost, is I want to thank CAP and DWR um, for doing this. I think I can speak for most of the folks in the room recognize it hasn't been an easy path for you folks as of late. And so on behalf of RWCD and our folks, I'd like to thank you for putting that aside and getting this done. Um, I'd also like to thank the Bureau for being willing to work with us. And I'm going to probably use some bad grammar here, but not to us is probably the best way to put it. Um, I'd also like to thank Senator Griffin and Representative Bowers for their listening sessions over the last several months. Uh, in particular, and for those of you who know me, I will crow the great things Arizona has done for water. But what we have been abysmal on is informing the public to keep them aware of what's happening and what's going on. And I think that will be of critical importance to this. Um, I want to echo some of what has already been said, in particular with regards to Tim's comments about I believe the goal of this obviously is an effective um, DCP. But I think this group, similar to what we did out of a number of other different venues, the Gila River and Community Water Rights Settlement, allow us to address some very significant long-term planning that needs to be done when this is resolved. Um, I, and personally, I really like the seating arrangement. Um, whether Governor Lewis might realize it or not, one of my earliest memories was being a part of the Gila settlement, sitting behind my father and his father as they negotiated a number of significant issues. Um, and with that, I would like to again thank the group for recognizing the critical role of the Native American communities and their need to be involved in the process. Um, for those of you who might be asking, what is RWCD doing here? Yes, there is still agriculture in Maricopa County. Um, we also provide water to residential, industrial, and municipal users, and if I'm not mistaken, we'll be approaching close to a million acre feet of water stored on behalf of a plethora of partners. And with that, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to be here, and we look forward to both a constructive and a respectful process. Thank you. Governor Stephen Earl Lewis, the Gila River Indian Community. Uh, the, the community is very pleased to be here at this table. Uh, and as the largest entitlement holder for water from the Colorado, Colorado River delivered through the CAP, the community is deeply concerned, of course, with this issue of shortage. And we are listening, and we will participate actively uh, in the coming meetings to see if there is some way to support DCP moving forward. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Cheryl Lombard, Valley Partnership. Uh, on behalf of our members, but also our industry, which is not just home building, it is also the commercial and industrial development. Um, we are investing in the future of Arizona. Our members have hundreds of thousands of acres across the state. We're sitting here very concerned about excess water, the future CAGRD, but we're also very excited to have our legislators and as well on the future of our, our Native Americans and the future of our state. Um, I do have one question, which Ted and I talked about earlier, was just some more detail on the Arizona Conservation Plan. So maybe at the end, if you can say what you said to me during the break, that would be helpful. I'm Ted Maxwell with the Southern Arizona Leadership Council. I'm going to echo a lot of the comments that were already made, and so I'll keep it short. One is thank you to both the, the department and to CAP for pulling us all together. The representation around this table is truly representative of all of Arizona from a regional perspective as well as from the different sectors that we're, we're uh, representing. So to me, it's all about collaboration. Everybody's got the right attitude here. We've got to write the, and I'm not going to focus on us coming up with a solution that's a win-win. I'm going to focus on what's going to be the lose-lose, and that's if we can't come to a collaboration. The time is now, and when it comes to getting it through the legislature, uh, Mr. Noble, I think the best way to do it is to walk out of here with a, a, an agreement that we all are passionate about. You look around this room, there's plenty of people involved that will help us carry it then, and it's our responsibility not only to come up with the best way forward, but then to help carry it through the le legislature. 
Our legislators always open and listens to us. And the more we talk to them, the more we can t tell them what we, what, how strongly we believe in what we come up with. I'm not worried about it getting through the legislature at the end of the day. So I'm really honored to be part of this organization. And again, thank you for opening up the collaboration a little bit broader to cover all Arizonans. I am Dennis Patch, uh, Chairman of the Colorado Tribes. It's uh, nice to be invited here and be a participate in this uh, for all the important water issues in Arizona. And uh, it's important to know reservations are in Arizona too. And we have all the same problems that everyone else has. Uh, you know, tribes don't usually get invited to these type of meetings. I think it would be good if they do because I think uh, tribal water is part of the solution. And I think everyone needs to acknowledge that in some way. And uh, we have uh, two goals for our participation in this. One is to protect our water rights uh, on the reservation. And we want to have a sustainable economy like everyone's talking about here, no matter who you're representing. Uh, we want that to use, do that with our water. And we're glad we're here. We're one of the uh, few uh, entities that can actually bring water to you uh, and everyone here. And so we believe our participation in discussions will help the state of Arizona, the water users in the state of Arizona, and also help our, our tribal goal of having a sustainable, uh, sustainable economy too, much like all the rest of you you're talking about. So thank you for inviting us. Uh, again, Anthony Francisco uh, from the uh, Don Autumn Legislative Council sitting in for uh, Chairman Edward Manuel of the Don Autumn Nation. Uh, I just wanted to highlight one of the proposed uh, sideboards and uh, Chairman Patch had, had in, um, alluded to, um, and that is the, uh, and I'll, I'll read off from this uh, proposed sidebars, uh, operate, operate within it and respect existing legal authorities, contracts, and priorities. And I believe it, it really speaks to the settlements that have been um, negotiated, you know, when tribes fought long and hard to try to replenish their lands. Um, and today, some settlements are still pending. Some settlements still haven't ha reached full uh, appropriations. Um, therefore, you know, hopefully moving forward, we respect uh, these trust responsibilities. You know, they're very important. Um, they're, they're, you know, I, as tribes, we see them um, um, beyond contracts and agreements. Um, but with that being said, um, you know, tribes understand the importance of water uh, or lack thereof and hope to continue this working dialogue. Um, I, too, want to thank you. Thank you for allowing tribes. Uh, I know not all tribes are here. I believe there's just a little over 10 percent of the tribes represented here. Uh, however, there are those tribes that are in the audience um, for sitting at the table. As mentioned, you know, through these settlements, you know, tribes did fight long and hard to try to get their seat at the table. So thank you for inviting us. Um, then in closing, I would just um, concur with the comment of any meetings hosted in Tucson. We definitely would like to be there. <laughs> I don't know about the meetings in Tucson. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I, thank you very much for bringing us all together. We really appreciate it. And um, I'm very hopeful for this process, that it, that it is an equitable process and that we can look at all sides um, I also wanted to focus on the proposed sideboard, the, the similar one, the operate within and respect existing legal authorities, contracts, and priorities. I, while I agree that that is important and we have to recognize, it, particularly our tribal settlements, those are long and hard fought for. I think what we, the settlements that we do have are very important to this process. Um, the tools using tribal ICS and, and many of the other tools are going to be very critical to getting across that finish line in a successful way like you like you sort of outlined Ted um, but I think we also have to be willing to look within those existing authorities to actually get to the to the end of this I think there might be some very important including federal and state authorities that we we really need to look at CAP priorities or CAP um, policies that I think we're going to have to look really hard at so that we can get to the to the end and I appreciate uh, again everybody being here um, our tribal representatives um, specifically um, appreciate the federal government and the state and CWCD and our legislators and all the rest of us schmucks for for hanging out here um, one last thing uh, being the uh, apparently the only industrial <laughs> representative Thanks a lot. Um, I think we're going to have to, uh, I just wanted to, to point out that we, we will be looking to create a, a, 
a subcommittee to, to get the input from our industrial partners. Um, so I guess I have another job, and hopefully I've been talking with uh, Glenn to see how we can might be able to do that through the chamber. So I appreciate your help. Actually, Richard will be doing it. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, Ted Kowalski with the Walton Family Foundation. And again, thank you for including us and, and including the NGO community in this conversation. Um, at the Walton uh, Family Foundation, we, we try to take on some of the most difficult um, social and environmental issues facing the, the country and the world. And um, the Colorado River is one of those challenges. And so we, I, I come here today with a slightly broader perspective, both in terms of scope, because we are trying to ensure a healthy Colorado River for the entire Colorado River Basin, but also um, we have a higher or broader perspective in terms of time scale, because we're working on problems that are um, take 10 or 20 or 30 years to solve. And the Colorado River um, is, is uh, no exception. Um, that being said, on behalf of the NGO community, um, you know, we're, we're pleased to be part of this conversation and we're pleased to see CAP and the state together convening this group. And I think that's a critical change from the last time around, Wade. I mean, I think you, you have both leaders coming together and saying this is too important to, uh, to, to fail. And, and I think that's, that's great. With regard to our um, perspectives on the Colorado River Basin, um, I believe, and I think we believe at the Walton Family Foundation, that it, that the solutions lie um, in in not uh, failing any one geographic area or any one sector, including the environmental sector. It, we we have to find solutions that work for for all geographies and for all all sectors, and I think that's true for the state of Arizona as well. And, and it's, I'm pleased to see so many different sectors and geographies represented here today. Um, I want to echo uh, the points that Hunter made a little while ago and, and just remind you that, that you are not uh, alone, that there is an entire basin that is dependent on your success or failure. And the fact that Mexico and California have both voluntarily agree to take reductions that they're not required to under the law um, is an important and critical um, factor that I, I uh, ask you to consider as you try to work your way through these very difficult problems. Um, and with that, uh, I'm actually out of the Denver office of the Walton Family Foundation, so I'm happy to bring you guys all up to Denver during the summer months um, if you're so inclined. Thank you. <laughs> but you're not, you're not here on behalf of the upper basin. Are you? Yeah. No, <laughs> I'm the entire basin. <laughs> uh, Dave Roberts on behalf of SRP, and I'd like to thank Tom and Ted for inviting SRP to be a part of this, um, part of the committee. We look uh, forward to working with you all and the rest of the committee. We support DCP um, throughout our history. We've been in, involved in a lot of innovative solutions on water matters in this state. I've uh, been partners in a lot of different uh, programs as well, um, and we look forward to helping out wherever we can to bring solutions and to hear uh, other people's ideas and provide insight into that. So we look forward to helping out. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thank you, everyone, for all those great, great comments and encouragement. Um, just listening, listening to all of that, and um, uh, helps helps me to be comfortable with the selections that we've made. And so we've got some great people sitting at the table. We've got some great people sitting in the audience, and we're going to hear from you next. So your patience will be rewarded. Um, we we now have uh, so just some logistical things first. Um, we have some staff with the microphone with a couple of microphones that are available. So you can raise your hands and be recognized by the chair. That will be Tom who will pick you, um, so that you can address your questions to the committee. If members of the public have any questions about what was discussed today that we don't get to today because of lack of time or you didn't think of the question that you wanted to ask, we ask each of you to reach out to, I guess I need to change the slide, reach out to one of your delegates that represents your sector or any delegate or contact our respective Public information officers, those names, email addresses are listed on the slide 
up there. For the media, as we discussed at the press conference at the end of the June 28th meeting, please reach out to the CWCD or ADWR PIOs listed on the slide. Um, and Tom and I will make ourselves available for joint interviews as we've been doing for the last couple of months. We found that to be very effective um, in, in practice for us. Um, and uh, uh, while we still have about a half an hour left uh, today, I'd like to thank everyone for coming in advance. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone who asked a question this afternoon uh, for coming and, and being patient to wait to the end to ask your questions. So we're ready to go. Please raise your hand. I see no hands being raised, so I would ask the legislators to recognize that everyone must be in an agreement and we're ready to go. <laughs> no questions, comments from our public participants? Yes, sir. Would you please identify yourself as well in the organization you represent? That would be helpful. Certainly. Uh, Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Adam Andrews, and I'm from uh, Thorn Autumn Nation of the Santa Rosa District, wherein we have a lot of land, and we have an organization called the Santa Rosa Latinos Association, which I serve as the vice president too. I just want to uh, echo the uh, statement made by our council member here representing the tribe in that the legal authorities that lie within uh, existing statutes and settlements are important to us. And I want to uh, also just, um, I guess, remind uh, the, uh, the those in the uh, legislature that uh, the tribes have certainly played a lot of emphasis in trying to get to the point where those settlements were reached. And uh, to come to this stage uh, is yet another, you know, level of discussion, level of legal minds to come together, to come to solution. And we certainly appreciate being, being asked to be a part of the committee. Um, so I want to thank you for that. Um, the other is that um, in Santa Rosa District, in, in our land uh, development there at Don Autumn, is agriculture. So we also share some sentiment in terms of the agriculture that is being uh, at the, discussed here at the table. So I want to just make mention of that. And those are my comments here today. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Kerry Meister. And uh, although I am active on the steering committee of the Sustainable Water Working Group, I am not speaking on its behalf. I am speaking on my own behalf. Um, <laughs> As you know, we requested to be on the committee and were turned down. And uh, we were advised to contact our sector representative for our specific interests. However, as I look at this committee, however distinguished it is and how broadly representative it is, it still does not, to me, represent environmental interests. And therefore, I'm at a bit of a quandary as to whom to address on this committee with environmental concerns, because I just don't feel that we're being represented. So there perhaps might be opportunities with individual issues that you have to look around the room, but to pick on my friend Ted, <laughs> I think Ted is your main contact in general for the NGO community. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I would be happy to talk to you afterwards and, and want to make sure that the environmental interests are represented here and in this conversation to be sure. And in fact, um, there's already been uh, one NGO uh, organization that submitted comments specifically to Tom and to Ted and to myself and um, related to groundwater. And, and you know, I think um, echoing the comments of my colleague Tim, I think, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that this process, while um, it cannot solve every single problem facing the state of Arizona, that it protects the integrity of um, the Groundwater Management Act that exists, to be sure. And, um, you know, I'm certainly happy to, to talk to you afterwards, and uh, we, we do want to represent your interests.
Others? No one wants to get up and offer water or money to the mitigation plan at this point in time? <laughs> Ted. Yes, maybe, maybe I could take a moment while, while folks are thinking of a question to ask and, and address um, Ms. Lombard's uh, question from earlier. And, and I certainly would in, invite Tom to, to add to, to my comments here. And the question specifically was, what is this Arizona Conservation Plan thing? Of the four essential elements, ag mitigation, excess water plan, tribal intentionally created surplus or ICS, and the Arizona Conservation Plan. This is my, my view of it, but I think it overlaps a lot with what, what Tom's is. Not that we differ, it's just there's, there's, there's lots of area that's covered by that. And that maybe is the main point. Those three specific tools, the first three that I mentioned, ag mitigation, um, excess water, and tribal ICS, are, are tools for um, conserving water and leaving water in, in Lake Mead in an effort to uh, meet our obligations under DCP and maybe do some other, other things as well. And those will fit into the broader Arizona Water Conservation Plan. The plan includes everything else, in, in my mind, of, that we might do to be able, in addition to those three tools that we, that we would be able to do um, to help us achieve the goals of impl implementing DCP. And it also includes what I believe is a process um, that we would employ as well for how do we uh, remain a sustainable and flexible um, throughout the, the, the period that DCP will be in, be in place. Um, there are certain things that happen during the year, the, April, the August 24-month study, uh, that will determine whether or not and what the shortage will be the following year, and uh, orders need to be finalized uh, before the end of the year. What do we... What process do we follow to bring that together to make sure everybody is on the same page in a way that will incorporate the three discrete and any other tools that we identify and what and quote unquote what else we need to do, particularly as we had moved, say, from a tier one to a tier two shortage, then our obligation is going to be a lot higher next year than what we've managed to do the year before that. That's what the Arizona Conservation Plan is, is an umbrella that fits all those, the ones that we can identify and the ones we haven't thought of yet and a process to integrate all of that thing into, into a sustainable uh, um, um, tool for us to carry this out over an extended period of time. And, and I'll just add, Ted, the, the Arizona Conservation Plan uh, will also, as one of its elements, look at what we can do to uh, prop up the lake. Uh, maybe in the near term, it's still possible to prop up the lake and keep it above 1075. Maybe not, depending on how the hydrology plays out. Uh, depends on how much water we need to do that. And then we may target if the lake keeps dropping despite our efforts, looking at other target elevations where uh, shortage volumes would increase to Arizona and targeting some conservation to avoid those outcomes. So it can be a lot of different things. And one of the challenges, and Ted alluded it with the water ordering processes, the timing of uh, folks who have the water and who might conserve it and how it works for them to plan on whether they're going to use the water directly or conserve it is a key element of the conservation plan and a huge challenge given that the reclamation makes their operational decision in August, water order process, non-tribal October, tribal November, to try to put this something together in that short time period is going to be very challenging. but. It will be part of all the discussions of the Arizona Conservation Plan. So I see we have another question. Yes, uh, <clears throat> uh, a statement, but my name is Terry Romney. I'm the chairman of the San Carlos Apache Tribe, Southeast Arizona, located between Globe and uh, Sapper. And uh, the reason I'm here is, <clears throat> is uh, I'm interested in what's going to develop from this committee because we have a lot at stake from our end, too. Uh, I, I'm beginning to understand that most of the people are sitting around this table in the steering committee uh, are the ones that are going to be affected the most because most of you have lower priorities. And, <clears throat> and we, we are in the higher priority category. And so uh, with uh, Central Arizona Project Water, so I just want to make sure about that. Even though I see 
my friend, uh, Colorado River Indian tribe, Ben Snakes, who I understand has the highest, highest priority of all of us in this room. And, uh, <clears throat> but I want to make sure that the process going forward follows what I heard earlier, that the existing laws and the uh, priorities and the contracts that are in place, we have a contract with, with uh, we have a cap contract, we've had it since 1980, that those stay in place, that they are not rearranged in any ways as you guys go through this process. I just want to let, that, uh, let my wishes be known on that one. So thank you. Thank you. Another hand being raised. Dan. Dan Pelander, I'm a farmer in Pinal County, and I'm not going to say anything about egg mitigation, although obviously that's what my big uh, concern is. But there's a large group of water leaders here, and uh, Ron Rayner, who I think some of you know, sent me an email, and it was relating to the plans to build, uh, the potential plans to build a pumping station to recycle Lake Mead water to use Lake, to use uh, Hoover Dam as a storage bank for power to circulate water back and forth using solar power to pump it. But in that email, which I have not confirmed, but he said that California in the last 22 months has let 56 million acre feet of water flow out into the Pacific Ocean. 56 million acre feet. We're all Arizonans here and we're talking about 10,000 acre feet, 100,000 acre feet. And California has done 56, 56 million acre feet has flowed out, a lot of it under the Golden Gate Bridge. So my friends from the environmental community, sir from the Walton Foundation, maybe the Walton Foundation could get behind an effort to try to figure out how to protect the fish in a reasonable way, but not let 56 million acre feet flow out into the Pacific Ocean while we in Arizona are struggling to figure out how to uh, keep using 1.6 million acre feet a year. So it's a little off the subject, but there's a big group here and nobody was jumping at the mic, so I thought I'd throw it out there. <laughs> So again, Dan, as you mentioned, you understand it's a little bit tangential, but one of the things over the past five years as I've been working with the other states on what's now DCP that's become evident is that we are linked into issues across the basin in ways that have not always been evident. And the sustainability in California and how Northern California and Southern California fit together and issues like the one that you raised certainly bring home that that uh, we are linked in ways and we are connected in ways. And the DCP is a step in recognizing that linkage and having collaborative efforts to deal with at least in the lower basin DCP, Lake Mead, in a way as several have spoken uh, so far today that you know shares some of the burdens and doesn't totally put the burdens on the state of Arizona exclusively. Any others? Seeing none, I'll thank all the members of the committee and members of the public for attending, and we look forward to seeing you all on August 9th. Thank you.